Guys, unless you've been living under a rock, I guarantee you've heard of the Foo Fighters experienced by Allied and Axis fighters during World War II, or Commander David Fravor's encounter with the Tic Tac off the coast of San Diego in 04. And I know that viewers of this channel will be familiar with the scintillating Many Sace and Tehran Iran UFO encounters. But what about official Air Force UFO encounters around the world that have flown under the radar? It is UAP Gerb, guys. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm going to cut to the chase and let's cover four Air Force UFO encounters from around the world that you have probably never heard of. Please remember to like and subscribe and leave a comment below which case caught your attention the most. Our first encounter takes place on October 1st, 1948, over Fargo, North Dakota, USA. The Gorman dogfight was written by Captain Edward J. Ruppelt, the project's sign, grudge, and blue book director, as one of three classic UFO incidents in 1948 that, quote, proved to Air Force intelligence specialists that UFOs were real. I'll cover these other cases in another video, but let's dial into Gorman's experience. George F. Gorman was a seasoned veteran pilot of World War II. Following 1945, he became a second lieutenant in the North Dakota National Guard. In clear skies around 9 p.m. on our encounter's date, the second lieutenant was participating in a National Guard cross-country flight in a P-51 Mustang. Gorman observed a small Piper Club plane 500 feet below him, but besides that, there was no other traffic in the area. Shortly after, he saw an object to the west. Contrary to the Piper Club, he could not make out a wing on this object. What he did observe was a small, blinking light. At 9.07 p.m., Gorman contacted ATC at Hector Airport only to find there was no other traffic in the region. The second lieutenant moved his Mustang to 350 to 400 miles per hour to pursue the object and determine its identity. Gorman quickly realized the object was too fast to pursue in a straight vector, so he began attempting to corner the object through tight turns. When approaching the blinking light at 5,000 feet after a right turn, the object flew over his aircraft at a distance of only 500 feet. It was during this near collision, Gorman got a clear look at the object, a simple ball of light about six to eight inches in diameter, whose blinking ceased and luminosity grew as the object increased speed. It was then that Gorman briefly lost sight of the object until he witnessed it approaching him head on again, where it suddenly made a steep vertical climb. The P-51 Mustang had to make a 9,000 foot climb in elevation, only to stall when the ball was still 2,000 feet overhead. For his final attempt to intercept the object, Gorman waited at 14,000 feet until the ball had lowered to 11,000 feet. Then he dove at the object at full power, but again, the UFO performed an impossible vertical climb until it had passed out of sight. It was then, at 9.27 p.m., Gorman abandoned pursuit and headed back to Hector Airport. Now, it's crucial to note that air traffic controller at Hector L.D. Jensen observed the object pass overhead through binoculars, but could not discern the blinking luminosity of the object. Gorman swore his account into legal record on October 23, 1948, where he said, quote, I am convinced that there was definitely thought behind its maneuvers. I am further convinced that the object was governed by the laws of inertia because its acceleration was rapid, but not immediate, and although I was able to turn fairly tight at considerable speed, it still followed a natural curve. When I attempted to turn with the object, I blacked out, temporarily due to its excessive speed. I am in fairly good physical condition, and I do not believe that there are many, if any, pilots who could withstand the turn and speed affected by the object and remain conscious. The object was not only able to outturn and outspeed my aircraft, but was able to attain a far steeper climb and was able to maintain a constant rate of climb far in excess of my aircraft. So now let's tackle the follow-up official investigation into the dogfight. Of course, at this time in 1948, Project Sign was in charge of investigating UFOs. The project was created due to Lieutenant General Twinning's assertion that flying disks were, quote, real and not visionary or fictitious, end quote, 
in a letter to Air Force Commanding General George Schlugen. All sign reports were required to be sent to the Army and Navy Research and Development Board, the USAF Scientific Advisory Board, and, you guessed it, the Atomic Energy Commission. Project Sign interviewed Gorman and other witnesses and also checked his P-51 Mustang for radiation. The craft was measurably more radioactive than other fighters, leading investigators to conclude that the craft had flown close to an, quote, atomic-powered object. Initially, Sign ruled out weather balloons, jets, etc. But of course, after further investigation, radiation was relegated to less shielding from radiation at 14,000 feet, and Gorman either apparently chased a lit weather balloon or Jupiter that only appeared to perform fantastic feats from his own frame of reference inside the Mustang. The April 12th, 1969 Poren Seitzman Ilma Pailoa, sorry about that, incident remains the only UFO observation acknowledged by the Finnish Air Force. During a Fauga Magister jet training mission at Pori Airport, Finnish Defense Force flight controller radio to pilot Tarmo Tukeva to investigate seven assumed air balloons floating at 1,500 to 3,000 meters above the airport. Upon approach, Tukeva reported the objects were not balloons, but disc-shaped and slightly round, quote, like balls with no extremities and pale yellow in color. These objects accelerated away from him at great speed against a headwind of 180 kilometers per hour as he tried to approach. A second pilot, Jauku Koronen, observed the objects as well, confirming the anomalous shape and speed. No sonar signatures were made by Pori Airport, but radar detection 200 kilometers away in the town of Vasa detected the seven objects after they had rapidly accelerated away from Tukeva creating an estimated speed of 3,218 meters per second. Now, I know this is a short case, the trail ends here, but I thought it'd be pretty interesting to talk about because not often do we hear from Scandinavian nations about their UFO sightings. Our next story takes place over Arequipa, Peru on April 11th, 1980. I found out about this case through the same DOD Joint Chiefs briefing that highlights the 1968 crash disc in Nepal when covering the moon dust. On early morning of April 11th at La Jolla Air Base, Lt. Oscar Santa Maria Huertas was ordered to take off in his Russian-made Sukhoi-22 fighter to intercept the strange silvery object that had been spotted floating near the end of the runway. Huerta stated the object was, quote, in restricted airspace without authorization, representing a grave challenge to national sovereignty. Now, this sighting was during periods of high concern for espionage in Peru. Huertas quickly flew to 2,500 meters and prepared for an attack run on the strange orb-like object. Quote, I reached the necessary distance and shot a burst of 64 30 millimeter shells which created a cone-shaped wall of fire that would normally obliterate anything in its path. Assuming the object was a balloon, Huertas thought he would observe the balloon be torn to shreds with bursts of outpouring gas. But the barrage had no effect on the object. Immediately following the barrage, the object shot skywards, forcing Huertas to activate his afterburners and travel at 1.6 Mach to chase the object from 500 meters. After an 84 kilometer chase, the object came to an instant standstill, forcing the lieutenant to take a sharp turn to avoid collision. It was then Huertas re-engaged, stating, quote, I began closing in on it until I had it in perfect sight. I locked on the target and was ready to shoot. But at that moment, the object made another fast climb, evading the attack. I was left underneath it. It broke the attack. The pilot then tried, similar to Gorman, approaching the object from above, attempting to climb above the object standing still at 14,000 feet, 
but the UFO shadowed his movements all the way up to 19,200 feet. Running low on fuel, Huertas approached within 100 meters of the object to get a closer look. Quote, I was startled to see that the balloon was not a balloon at all. It was an object that measured about 10 meters in diameter with a shiny dome on top that was cream colored, similar to a light bulb cut in half. The bottom was a wide circular base, a silver color and looked like some kind of metal. It lacked all the typical components of an aircraft. It had no wings, propulsion jets, exhaust, windows, antennae, and so forth. It had no visible propulsion system. At this moment, Huertas realized he had engaged a UFO. This realization alongside his low fuel paralyzed the man with fear. He quickly zigzagged away from the craft, hoping his pattern would make his aircraft hard to hit and take down. Upon returning to base, multiple eyewitnesses and base personnel also observed the object and this led to the official DOD investigation in the document I mentioned above, where Huerta's story is corroborated that he fired barrages of 30 millimeter shells at this UFO, which had no damaging effects and was still able to perform incredible aerial maneuvers. And lastly, we have the Mexico UFO incident that occurred on March 5th, 2005, over the southern state of Campeche in Mexico. It was here the Mexican Air Force filmed 11 unidentified flying objects for a period of minutes. Lights filmed by the pilots using infrared equipment appeared to fly at altitudes of 3,500 meters and surrounded the jet as it conducted routine anti-drug trafficking vigilance in Campeche. Only three of the objects showed up on the plane's radar, but Major Magdaleno Castañon said the military jets chased the lights, quote, and I believe they could feel we were pursuing them, end quote. I'm going to play this clip in its entirety, but of course, before we do, let's review what the skeptics say. Michael Shermer, you may know him uh, from getting cooked on a debate with Graham Hancock on the Joe Rogan Experience, head of Skeptic Magazine, and other detractors suggest the lights were burn-off flares on an offshore oil platform in the Gulf of Mexico, I personally choose to believe the military pilots, but you can side with Shermer if you see that as a plausible explanation. What's up guys, it's UAP Gerb. Thank you so much for joining me. Before we dissect this video, I'd like to throw out there, come join my UAP Gerb Discord group. I'll have the link down in the description. It's a great place for us to chat, share cases. I'll share all my case files and so forth, pop up some interesting tweets, some interesting videos and documentaries, and just an all around place to chat UAP your life. So come through, join, it's a wonderful place. But anyways, a couple interesting Air Force UFO encounters throughout the world. I find the Gorman dogfight and the Peruvian case the most interesting with the most sensory data and the most compelling cases for the objects seen being UFOs and not of prosaic origin. I think the Finnish case is a bit tricky, but I lean towards a UFO explanation mainly because of the pilot's ironclad testimony. And the 2004 Mexico sightings, a bit curious to me. Um, I think this of all four cases has the highest probability of a prosaic explanation. However, I'm not sure if these objects seen, the 11 objects, three of which were detected on radar, were in fact just flares. I don't know, more analysis needs to be done on this case. Uh, it's a pretty famous case down in Mexico. It doesn't get enough attention up here in the States, but couple quick cases. I hope you enjoyed the Gorman dogfight. That one is fascinating. And credit to the YouTube channel whose clips I used. Awesome recreation out there. Um, but I'll make a part two to this video. A couple more cases out there to check in. But thank you so much for joining, guys. Please remember to like and subscribe, and I'll catch you later. Bye.